So uh, we'll move on to the next symposium, which is the regional blocks for specific surgeries. And to chair this symposium is Dr. Aminuddin Ahmad. He's a consultant anesthetist from Hospital Putrajaya. So I'd like to welcome him and give him a round of applause. Thank you. Okay, Assalamu alaikum and very good morning. Uh, our first speaker in, after the break is uh, Professor Manoj Kumar Kamaka. Uh, he's a regional anesthesia and uh, he's a professor in, uh, he's a director of pediatric anesthesia at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, Prince of Wales Hospital in Hong Kong. And his area of research interests include regional anesthesia, technique, and in particular, thoracic paravetral block, spinal sonography ultrasound guided central nervous block and local anesthetic pharmacology. Uh, Professor Kamaka is internationally uh, recognized to his research in uh, regional anesthesia and has published extensively in various high impact uh, peer review journals and has been invited to speak at a numerous international meetings around the world. He also authored uh, numerous uh, books chapter and co-edited several uh, reference textbooks of regional anesthesia and he is currently Secretary General of the OSRA, Asian Oceanic Society of Regional Anesthesia and also past President of the Asian Society of Pediatric Anesthesiologists, ASPA. Dr. Kamaka currently serves as an editorial board members and reviewer for several major peer review journals in anesthesiology. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Professor Kamaka. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Dr. Aminuddin, for this kind introduction. Uh, before I begin, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for having uh, trusted the RA Asia organization and having come from far and wide. I see many faces, not Malaysians, so that's even better. Uh, secondly, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for this excellent job to putting all this together. And not many people uh, recognize the MC's uh, contribution, so thank you, Jayanti. You're doing a great job. Okay, now I'm going to try and talk to you about uh, the story about the truncal blocks about breast surgery. And since I've already spoken a little bit about it before, it becomes a lot easier. Uh, I'm from the Faculty of Medicine. I work at the Prince of Wales Hospital in the New Territories of Hong Kong in the Chinese University. If any of you are passing there, doing shopping, and you're getting bored, most welcome to visit us. Um, I know many of you go to Hong Kong to shop, so. I have no conflict of interest to declare. Relationship is usually gastronomic, otherwise nothing beyond that. Uh, because I'm a, an editor, uh, I am obliged to say that I have published this book. If you're not a lucky recipient of it, you're most welcome to find out details how to buy this. It is the cheapest bestseller in the market today. Uh, also, it would be unfair for me not to invite you back to Hong Kong. So this is a meeting I hold every year, and as somebody said, the concept of spine imaging began in these humble doors in the Chinese university. So today everybody is talking about spine imaging. I feel so proud about it, but I keep quiet. Now breast surgery is a very common procedure. It's done all over the world. And this is some epidemiological data in Hong Kong uh, in the 90s, which show that during the period that they were assessing, they found an increase in the incidence from year after year. And the incidence is about 30 to 35% uh, per 100,000. So the, uh, the sampling is probably the similar in, in Malaysia. So why should we be doing regional anesthesia for breast surgery? I think first let's address that. Major breast surgery is frequently performed under general anesthesia. If you were to do research on nausea vomiting, this is a template of doing it because it, 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 it is associated with a high incidence of nausea vomiting. Even with anti-emetic therapy, the incidence still remains high. Now, these data are from the era when volatile anesthetics were used. Today, we use TIVA. So propofol is the standard of care in breast surgery today in my unit. We use total intravenous anesthesia with propofol. Even in control groups, the incidence is very low. So this is just to scare you, but today the incidence is not so high. They also are very little understood about the long-term morbidity of breast surgery. Uh, breast surgery, unfortunately, is associated with a very high incidence of chronic pain. The incidence ranges from 60 to 90 percent. Uh, it seems like the Caucasian population suffer from it more than, uh, than the Asians, as my data would suggest. Uh, chronic pain affects a very large number of these patients. 
The chronic pain, when it occurs, is a very difficult condition to treat in these patients because they are neuropathic in nature, and it starts immediately from the post-operative period. Although by definition, chronic pain is after three months, but you will start to see neuropathic pain from the moment they are in the post-operative care in the, in the PACU or in the recovery room. Uh, this impacts the quality of life. It causes uh, psychological and physical disability, so much so that some women go on to the phase of depression and even suicidal tendencies. So, and more importantly, the population at risk of this is, is expected to increase over the year and it's increasing, whether you're in Malaysia or in Singapore or in Hong Kong. Now, how do we go about this in a more scientific way and uh, to think about the regional anesthetic and analgesic techniques? So my objective today is to try and uh, illustrate to you uh, the various techniques that are, are available and uh, what we can use in, a, in a what works and what does not work. If you review the literature, techniques from epidurals, paravertebral, intercostal, interpleural, breast blocks is a field block and uh, more recently uh, the Blanco blocks have, have come up. Uh, and in fact, today we have in this audience uh, a master of the interpleural analgesia, Dr. Uh, Kundra here. But really, uh, currently these are the two main blocks that are, are talked about, the paravertebral, which is the gold standard, and I will defend it vehemently, uh, and some of the blocks that are, are being described, and very limited literature is available today in the, in the literature. I'm going to discuss mostly about major breast cancer surgery. So, it says here, paravertebral block or any region anesthetic block for that is not suitable for day case ambulatory minor breast cancer surgery. So if somebody, a young woman came to your care with a fibroadenoma of the breast, I don't do paravertebral blocks because the risk benefits are not there and there's probably no benefit in doing this in young healthy patient because you're not going to make a difference to the outcome. So you have to be prudent. So let's try and look at what works and what doesn't, and the science behind. And I think uh, I like to take a more scientific approach to explain to you what may be uh, uh, the best understanding as to how you can understand what works and what doesn't. I think the basis of this is based on your understanding of the sensory innovation of the breast, the axilla, and the chest wall. So the breast is, as I said before, it's very complex uh, innovation. It not only comes from the intercostal nerves, but it has a supply from other aspects. The intercostal nerves, particularly the T1 to T6, are involved. As you can see, T1 to T6 along the anterior, lateral, and posterior aspect are involved. The intercostal nerves are interesting because when they emerge, it gives off the lateral branch. The lateral branch comes out about the mid-axillary line. It divides into an anterior and a posterior. The anterior nerves become this, this is the lateral cutaneous branch, and this is the anterior branch, which becomes the lateral mammary nerves. So the lateral mammary nerves are the anterior branch of the lateral cutaneous nerve. The anterior branch continues, and it divides into a, a medial and a lateral branch. It is these this lateral branches become the medial mammary nerves. So when you look at the, the lateral intercostal nerves, the mammary nerves, these are the lateral intercostal nerve T2 to T6. They come out along the mid-axillary line, and the medial uh, mammary nerves are T1 to T6 along the mid part parasternal area in this area. And as you can see, the lateral uh, cutaneous branches of the, of the intercostal are very closely related to the serratus anterior muscle, related to the latissimus dorsi, and also the long thoracic and the thoracodorsal nerve are in this, in this so-called intercostal plane. The T2 to T6 are the ones that are involved in the lateral aspect of the, of the breast, on the medial aspect of the breast, it's T1 to T6, okay? So there's a slight difference on the medial and lateral aspect. And uh, also the breast has some contribution from the supraclavicular nerves. The supraclavicular nerves come from the uh, cervical plexus, the, uh, and it, they are divided into three. We have a medial, intermediate, and a lateral. The lateral actually contributes the shoulder joint, as Dr. Sakura said this morning. Um, it's usually the medial and the medial the middle uh, supraclavicular nerves. But fortunately, surgical incision does not involve this area because they are usually the upper subclavicular part, so infraclavicular area. So um, they're not usually involved unless your surgeon puts a big incision uh, uh, that high, which is very rare. Uh, the pectoral nerves have drawn a lot of attention today. They're described as two nerves. They come from the lateral and the medial um, cause of the brachial plexus. But as we discussed earlier, are they really truly motor nerves? They are not, as we said. Actually, there are literatures where investigators have suggested they have sensory components. 
And like most motor nerves, like the spinal accessory nerve is also described as the pure motor nerve. But actually there is some objective data looking at electron microscopic histochemistry of this nerve which show uh, sensory fibers, sympathetic fibers within these nerves. And this may apply also to the pectoral nerves. Also the pectoral nerves are not two nerves, they are more than two nerves. And this is an, imp uh, an important paper in my uh, understanding and if, if you are interested you should read this up. It's in the Journal of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. These investigators have demonstrated that there are more than two nerves, as I mentioned to you earlier. What they mean is when they dis dissected the cadavers, they found that they consistently found three nerves. One was a superior branch, there's a middle branch, and an inferior branch. So the superior branch, a middle branch, and an inferior branch, which actually goes underneath the pec minor, and then from underneath it will pierce the pec minor and enter the plane between the pec major and the minor. So here you can see that between the pec major and the minor, you only have the middle and the inferior branch. The superior branch is far away. Second important fact to remember is that there is an intertwined twining of these fibers with the ansa pectoralis. They communicate with each other. And the, this can be very complex. Furthermore, you can see this thoracoacromial artery, which is a very important landmark, and I will illustrate that to you. Because these nerves are very small, you will not see these nerves on the ultrasound. However wonderful your machine is. But you will always see this artery. And as you can see here, if you inject your local anesthetic next to that artery, it's conceivable that you may be able to spread the drug at the root where these nerves are formed. And that is the basis of the technique we describe and we use. Finally, as I said, the thoracoacromial artery is an important landmark. Also, there is very important uh, anatomical data which is not discussed, is that the spinal origin of these nerves are very variable. When we say the lateral uh, uh, pectoral nerve come from C4, C5, actually it can be as variable from C3 to C7. As, you, as Dr. Lee and their colleagues from, uh, from uh, Korea have demonstrated in this anatomical, you can see here, they painstakingly dissected the, the pectoral nerves and the, how they form, and you can see here that the origin of these nerves can be quite variable. Uh, and they found basically many different patterns where the origins can come from as low as C7 as from C4. So they describe what is described today as a subpectoral plexus of nerves. You can see here, there are not two nerves. There is a, a, a superior branch, a middle branch, and an inferior branch. In the, in the conventional lateral and medial pectoral uh, frame of things, the superior and the middle will form the lateral pectoral nerves, okay? The inferior and the ansa pectoralis will form part of the medial pectoral nerves. But to you, uh, you must understand that the concept of lateral and medial pectoral nerve is too naive, uh, and there is a wide uh, plexus of nerves. And this is a cadaveric dissection we have done. And I can show you here, this is the clavicle. As I separate the fibers of the pec major, you can see there's a large plexus of nerve inside. So there's a big network. It's not two nerves, okay? So therefore, the, um, the uh, innovation of the breast is very complex. It comes from multiple sources, so much so that you can see here that you need somewhere not only T1 to T6, you may need from C5 to T6. So now, you can understand why even a thoracic epidural may sometimes not be effective completely, with, even with a functional thoracic epidural. So now you can also understand why a PEX1 block may not be so effective. You can also understand why a paravertebral block may not be effective, because it may not provide complete anesthesia or analgesia of the breast. So now let's take a more uh, scientific approach and look and dissect each one of these techniques to know the good, bad, and the ugly of these and then see how they work. So the first is the paravertebral block. It's today, when you look at breast surgery, it's usually a modified radical mastectomy, where this is the clavicle. You're looking from the an anesthesiologist side, uh, and you can see they do an elliptical incision, which is far from the clavicle, so the infra, uh, supraclavicular nerves are usually not involved. And then they slowly peel the breast off from the pec major, and they dissect the axilla, so you're left with an incision like so. So where does thoracic paravertebral block fit in here? I think you have to understand the basics of this block. It's a technique where you inject the local anesthetic in the paravertebral area. It's into a wedge-shaped space. And when we do so, uh, in the interest of time, I just have to go to the facts. It produces ipsilateral, unilateral, somatic and sympathetic nerve blockade. As these investigators have demonstrated using thermographic imaging, that it produces ipsilateral, somatic and sympathetic nerve blockade. But 
You may go back with the understanding that if I inject a large dose of local anesthetic, I'll get a large spread. No, that's not very true. So what you will find is that the ipsilateral sympathetic somatic block is very variable. You can see here, these investigators injected about 20 cc's of 0.3 mils per kilogram in their um, British patients, and they found they produced a five dermatomes, a median of about five dermatomes. But you can see the range. I would look at the range. It ranged from one to eight. So if you're contemplating on doing anesthesia with this block, you'd be very surprised. You'd be very disappointed because on a Sunday, when you don't work, but on a Monday, you may find that you have eight dermatomes, so it works very well. But on Tuesday, when you come and do the same thing, you have one dermatome, so the patient says, ouch. So with a variable block like this, you cannot do it day after day consistently. So you need to do something that is more consistent. Uh, we've also demonstrated in patients with fracture ribs this variability. It varies from 3 to 11 in these cases. So this is one of the major limitations of a single-shot paravertebral block. <coughs> As I will illustrate to you, uh, this is a contrast study from my archive. You can see here, this is 10 cc of radio contrast injected through a catheter in the paravertebral space. You can see the spread is already very variable. And this is, again, through a single injection at that level. Interestingly, studies also show that age, gender, weight, dose, volume of local anesthetic does not influence the spread. So you could be injecting day and day out into the increasing the volume, but the spread will still be one dermatome. So don't get into the, con uh, the concept that, like epidurals, if you increase the dose, you'll get a bit of wider block. No, that's uh, not possible with paravertebral. As you see here, as you increase the dose, as you increase the dose, the number of dermatomes remains fairly similar. There's a very poor correlation. If you increase the volume, it doesn't really work. And more importantly, uh, it also has a very slow onset. So you need about 45 minutes before you get a, a very peak onset. This is, again, uh, with the use of, uh, uh, with, uh, in the landmark technique. Now, because we are now in the era of ultrasound, uh, you may say, uh, some critics may say, these data are all relevant for landmark-based technique, where the direction of needle was from posterior to anterior. But I have cooked up something for you. Dr. Marhofer and the group have also done studies where they have used ultrasound and they perform ultrasound guided blocks and they report the same variability. There's a marked variability in the, in the segmental spread of the drug from in the volunteers that they study. In contrast, multiple injection produce more reliable, more consistent clinical and radiological spread of, 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 of the block, ipsilateral block. So if you want to produce very consistent multi-level inject blocks or multidermatomal ipsilateral anesthesia, you have to do multiple injections. So this is uh, the, 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 the evidence to that. So how do you use paravertebral blocks uh, in light of this uh, scientific knowledge? You can use it as a single injection. You can use it as a multi-level injection, say T1 to T6 or C7 to T6. Or you can use it, in, there's also reports of continuous catheters. So when you look at uh, paravertebral block, now I may ask you this question. This is not part of your quiz, okay? So will a single injection paravertebral block be effective as the sole anesthetic technique for major breast cancer surgery? I like to see you all nod your head, no, no. I don't know, in India we share heads in many different ways. So, but I think the answer is no, no. Okay, so uh, this will not provide surgical anesthesia. However, uh, single shot paravertebral blocks have been used as an analgesic technique very effectively. You perform injections at T3, T4, you inject about 15 to 20 cc's, you get very effective pain relief, reduction of nausea, vomiting, improved recovery characteristics. We've also demonstrated in a prospective randomized double blind study that it not only affects post-operative uh, pain, but it can also affect long-term morbidity and mor uh, not mortality, sorry, morbidity. In this study, we had three groups. One is a control group with no blocks. The other two blocks had a, had a catheter placed in. This group had a single shot and then a placebo saline injection. And this group had local, local, okay, for three days post-operatively. So this is the three groups that we studied. And we followed them up for six months uh, and then today up to five years. We followed the same cohort of patients who started from day zero. They were similar and they went different paths and we followed them up to five years. I will present some data from that. We found no difference in acute pain. But these patients were on a very aggressive non-steroidal analgesic regime post-operatively. So, if you give your patients a good non-steroidal regime post-operatively, 
uh, patients who have major breast, like modified radical mastectomy, will have comparable acute and post -op. You may not see the difference in, in the early post-operative period. Go and ask your patient who's had major breast cancer surgery what your pain scores are, even after your general anesthetic. You will find they will report 30, 40 out of 100. It's only when you abduct the arm that they report pain. So uh, the patients will often report neuropathic type of pain even in the immediate post-op period but we did not definitely show uh, acute post-operative outcomes. Long-term outcomes are, are somewhat that is important today, and this is uh, Pekka Karolima from uh, Karolinska in, the, in, the, in Scandinavia. They were the first group to show that if you did a paravertebral block compared to a no block, they have lower pain scores at one month, six months, and 12 months. We also showed that although there was no difference in acute pain, but they had uh, significantly less severe chronic pain and fewer symptoms of chronic pain post-operatively. As you see here, actually the incidence of, this is the incidence of chronic pain. If they report pain at, uh, any pain at uh, three months relating to their breasts, which is not related to cancer uh, or, 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 or infection, then you see here there's no difference. At six months, the pain seems to burn out, okay? So there is a progressive reduction in pain. So when you talk about chronic pain after breast surgery, it does not stay ouch all the time. If you, if you manage them conservatively over time, it will fade away. So this is an important uh, finding of this study we found in this randomized. We also found that if you did the paravertebral block, they have better quality of life in terms of physical and both mental. They are much more happier. They are able to do activities much better. A lot of interest has been raised recently about the uh, role of paravertebral for cancer recurrence. Uh, this group from ectodectylose and the group from the uh, group with, in conjunction with some of the outcome group did a retrospective study where they showed that the uh, cancer-free recurrence and survival was significantly lower in the group that you gave paravertebral blocks. So if you give a single shot paravertebral, they survive longer and they have a, a, a lower incidence of recurrence. So when I told this to my surgeon, he started laughing. Uh, and i tell you why. I did not understand it then, but I will tell you why. I understand it today. But they were definitely showing in this retrospective data that if you did a paravertebral block, you survive longer and you have less cancer recurrence. But this is retrospective data. So there is potential for bias in these cases. Most people don't usually look at the fine prints in the, in the literature. You often look at the abstract. And this is what I recommend you not to do almost when you especially find a study like this. I will point out, ladies and gentlemen, in the same paper, look at the grade three cancer in these two groups. This is the general anesthesia group, and this is the paravertebral group. 42 patients, 42% 42 of patients in the general paravertebral group had grade three. This is like very extensive, you know, advanced cancer. In the GA group, 54%. Now, this is not statistically significant, but you can see here there's already about a 13% difference in their incidence of grade three cancer. If you're trying to show a difference of four or five patients survive more, then this is the apple and oranges you're talking about. So I do not believe this, and I don't urge you to believe this. So we also followed our patients, the same cohort that we had for, uh, for five years, and this is the result from five years. There's absolutely no difference in cancer recurrence. There's no difference in, um, uh, in survival uh, after, after five years. They're all the same, okay? Now, whether you're in Malaysia or you're in Australia or in New Zealand or in Hong Kong, the survival rate today after breast cancer with chemotherapy, surgery, radiotherapy is 95%. Are you telling me doing a paravertebral block will improve it beyond 95%? Hello. Secondly, oncologists are finding it difficult to, differ, to show an improvement in cancer outcome from one chemotherapeutic agent to another. When the, when the survival rate of breast cancer is so high, you can understand why. You will need uh, zillions of patients to show a difference. So oncologists uh, 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 are having problems because of the small effect size that uh, they are trying to show because the, the baseline survival is already high. So I urge you caution when you try to interpret this data. Okay, secondly, you can use it as a multiple injection uh, from T1 to T6. So now let me ask you this question. Will a multi-level paravertebral block be effective for major breast cancer surgery as the sole anesthetic technique? 
I can see some heads nodding. But before I started my research, the answer was yes. Okay, because they showed in the early post-operative period when you do multi-level injection, you can do, sorry, there's a lot of published data. You can use it in conjunction with sedation for surgical anesthesia with minimal complication, with a high degree of patient satisfaction, a high degree of surgical surgeon satisfaction, uh, cause less post-operative pain, nausea, vomiting, and fewer analgesic requirements, so much so they even short a hospital stay. So Dr. Greengrass was on the cover of the Rolling Stone, no, sorry, cover of the, uh, of the Times magazine. So, but I found it very difficult to reproduce this result, and today I have an answer. We, did, we do ultrasound-guided paravertebral blocks today, and we are very objective of what we do. If some of you want to learn more about the different techniques, this is a good article in anesthesiology. But we use a technique which does a transverse scan. We use a scan at the level of the articular process. Now, what is the articular process is another thing. But you usually scan between the two transverse processes at the level of the articular process, which forms part of the facet joints. And the articular process is very closely related to the foramina. So if you can recognize the articular process, you should be able to locate where the foramina is located. And although you will not see the nerve root because they are very small, you'll be able to recognize the anatomy in a better perspective. So this is the transverse scan we do. We are doing a transverse scan at the level of the ribs now. You can see this is the rib. This is the spinous process. The lamina, transverse process, and the rib, this is the costal chamber junction. If you go slightly caudad, this rib shadow will disappear, so you are between the two transverse processes. And this is the window that Dr. Shibata has described and most people around the world use, but actually the true paravertebral space is in the dark side of the moon. It's in the shadow of the transverse processes. But now you see, when I go below the transverse, I see the articular process, and there's no more shadow. The intervertebral foramina is located here. This is the pleura. This is the ligament. So this triangular space is the wedge-shaped space, which is the paravertebral space. So we insert the needle at the level of the articular process. The, insert, the needle is inserted like so, in plane. Again, this is a no-go zone. This is where the foramina is located. So you still inject laterally, but you can see the entire paravertebral space. As you see here, this needle is being introduced in plane uh, and is going to go through this uh, superior costal transverse ligament and uh, internal intercostal membrane complex and into this uh, paravertebral space. As you will see, the tip of the needle will emerge there and it is through there we inject the local anesthetic and produce uh, paravertebral blockade. Okay, in the interest of time, I need to move on, okay? so. This is the usual ergonomics. You do multi-level from T1 to T6. We start from T6 and, and move our way up, okay? Uh, and uh, the patient is then sedated with some dexmedetomidine. They receive midazolam and ketamine, a few milligrams of ketamine during the block because you do multiple injections. Um, they also receive oxygen and we monitor the CO2. Uh, for perioperative use, we use intraoperative, we use dexmedetomidine. And you can see here, the patient listening to music, no sunglasses, unfortunately. Uh, you see music and uh, they have surgery. Now this is where we found most of the time the patient would report pain. Uh, this is CO2 monitoring. So in our case we found this is the case series of about initial 25 to 30. Today we've done many hundreds of these patients uh, and we found that you had good somatic block. Uh, they had received very small doses of midazolam or dexmedetomidine but when you talk about the requirement of rescue analgesia intraoperatively, particularly ketamine, particularly when they were handling the pectoralis muscle and the breast was being uh, diathermized, we found that 80% of individuals in this cohort required ketamine. A very small doses though, it's about 20 to 30 milligrams, but that implied that there is more than just the paravertebral anesthesia or analgesia that you need to produce anesthesia of the breast. It then dawned on me that, see, when this breast is now being removed from the pec major and this is that uh, diathermy that they're applying, then the pec major is contracting, the patient reports dull pain. Now, paravertebral block does not block the pectoral nerves. So, uh, this is uh, based on that, okay? post operatively see they report no pain at all. Uh, that implies that a multi-level injection is not adequate on its own. You must have to do more than just... So, what about late outcomes after para multi-level injection? There are no published data today. Uh, we are following up some of these patients in our cohort. 
and we hope to report uh, the five-year uh, outcomes in chronic pain in these patients uh, in a very soon. You can also put a catheter. Now, do you, does, does a catheter make a difference? I will tell you the answer. Actually, they are Dr. Eilfeld uh, from uh, San Diego in the uh, University of California has used this in ambulatory patients. I'm not sure if he really does paravertebral blocks, but he certainly has a paper as a first author. And he's a triple mass placebo control, and he does many of these studies. In this case, I told you, one of these groups is a continuous catheter, which is the, the triangular pink shape. There's absolutely no difference in acute pain in the early period. There's no difference in chronic pain or in quality of life at three months or six months after surgery. So thereafter, I have stopped doing continuous paravertebral blocks in my patients because it really doesn't make a difference, and it adds a lot to your uh, workflow, there's a cost involved, etc. But if you give them good non-steroidal gabapentin, etc., in the post-operative period, they will have an exceedingly good goal. Uh, this is a good friend of mine, I got him to sign this photograph for you all today. So, uh, he has described some novel techniques, and they are really novel, they're very simple, but uh, as I mentioned to you, this, this depends on the concept of the chest wall. Uh, this is a panoramic view of the thoracic wall, uh, we need to inject the local anesthetic into either the interpectoral plane, which is the PEX1 plane, and the other one is between the PEC minor and the serratus anterior, which is the serratus plane. Actually, the serratus plane ex extends all the way down towards the posterior part, and here the block is now called the serratus plane block. So what about PEX1 block? You inject between the two muscles, he says it blocks the pectoral nerves. Do you believe that? So the question to you is the PEX1 block Will it block the pectoral nerves completely? The answer is basically no. If you're not clever, if you're not brave enough to say, I can tell you, it will not uh, block the entire pectoral plexus of nerves. And it cannot be used as a sole anesthetic technique for any breast surgery. But it can be very useful if you are going to use it for procedures like breast augmentation, subpectoral prosthesis, and I told you the reason before. Now we've been using a, a, a pectoral nerve blocks, but based on the concept that this is a plexus and there's a wide extensive uh, spread of the, of the nerves in the pectoral plane. So we use a two injection technique where we inject between the muscle and next to the thoracoacromial artery because as you saw here, the superior, middle and inferior including the ensa pectoralis are all related to that artery. This is the position of the patient. We do a paravertebral block and then we do a, another injection anteriorly. Uh, and uh, you can see here, they tuck the arm underneath, you do a transverse scan, and you will see uh, the thoracoacromial artery. This is the pec major, this is the pec minor, and this is the thoracoacromial artery next to the vein here, axillary vein, axillary artery, thoracoacromial artery. And everything is happening next to this artery. Uh, you can also see in between the interpectoral plane, the pectoral branch of the thoracoacromial artery is, lies in this plane. So the concept of the pectoral nerve or the pectoral plexus block we are not trying to block the intercostal nerves here, ladies and gentlemen. So this is a little different from the PEX2 block. Whereas Dr. Blanco wants to block the T2 to T6, our goal here is to block only the pectoral nerve. So we guide the needle first to the, uh, to the thoracoacromial artery. You can see here, you have to play a little bit with fire. So you have to be good with, uh, with your needling technique. Uh, you are going very close to the nerves, but when you inject, you can see the spread of the drug in the subpectoral plane. And this is the thoracoacromial artery, very close. Uh, and the next injection, you withdraw the needle and redirect it to the interpectoral plane, aiming for the, somewhere not for the artery, but in the plane where the artery is located. So when you inject your local anesthetic, you should see separation of the two muscles. It is not uncommon to inject it into the muscle. So I would suggest you should always look for this artery. And you can see here, it's pushing the pec minor and the artery is swimming in that plane. And you can see this block when you're done together. So now, in the first instance, we found that the paravertebral blocks were not adequate on their own, correct? 80% require rescue analgesia. So I did a prospective randomized double-blind study with a placebo uh, to look at whether a subpectoral plexus block would be useful. So we injected five cc's between the two muscles and five cc's deep to the muscle of 0.2% ropivacaine. And this is subject of our, our research. What we found is that the amount of ketamine usage in the group that had the PEX block, you see the pectoral block here. I must correct this, I should call it pectoral plexus block. You can see here, 
that they're significantly lower than the group that had uh, had no block at all or just a sham injection and the number of patients are significantly lower now it doesn't make it zero okay you see even the block that had the the pectoral plexus block 50% will require so now is a question of what is the volume what is the dose to find out what we need so we found out for the first step for the first time that if you do a pectoral plexus block with a paravertebral block it provides better anesthetic con conditions Okay, I got a few minutes, I'm officially finishing. Our PEX2 block is again by Dr. Blanco, one year later after the PEX1 block. It aims to block the T2 to T4. The aim is to inject the local anesthetic uh, deep to the PEC minor, and in between the PEC minor and the, the serratus anterior muscle, which, snug, which is very snug to the artery. Actually, they have also shown that an injection external to the muscle is, spreads better, produces longer duration of analgesia in the volunteer studies. Whereas this injection is deep to the serratus anterior muscle, today the, the concept is to inject between the pec major and the minor and between the serratus anterior and the pec minor in this plane uh, and at about the rib four or rib five. So this is our uh, illustration between rib three, four. So I aim for the rib four and you look for the plane. Very clearly, this is the interpectoral plane. This is the serratus plane and you inject your local anesthetic in this plane. So you inject X1, and redirect the needle there. So he describes using 10 cc here and inject 20 cc here. This should be uh, the ergonomics. We are injecting from a cranial caudal, the head here, the arm abducted, and you're injecting towards the axilla. Uh, and when you do this in a small volunteer studies, he's shown that it produces very extensive spread of the drug. And mind you, there are only about three volunteers in this study, but the images do look very consistent. Uh, he's, he's described that it's used for mastectomy, sentinel limb axillary clearance, for surgical anesthesia, wide local excision of the breast as a rescue block. Uh, time will only tell if this is really true. But this is a randomized study looking at nothing compared to something. Okay, so this group had a PEX1 and a PEX2 injection. This group had a standard general anesthesia. You can see here the VA spend score in the 24 hours are significantly lower in these group. The morphine consumption are also much lower. So the PEX 1 and 2 injection combined together does seem to work in these patients. This is a good work from Japan, although it's in the form of a, a, a letter, but I really agree with these individuals that it's a very important block in elderly individuals when you do not have much to offer these patients, when general anesthesia may not be an option, when paravertebrals may be very difficult because of scoliosis, etc. This is a good palliative surgery, palliative operation. You can do these blocks. Serratus plane block is the more recent. It's done more laterally, uh, and it's another novel ultrasound block, but it's done more laterally in relation to the latissimus dorsi and the, along the mid-axillary and posterior line. And you know the lateral intercostal nerves are all emerging here. So Dr. Blanco describes that injection deep to the latissimus dorsi and between the serratus anterior muscle will produce spread in relation to this, the teres major here and produces a block between T2 to T9 uh, with an injected of about 0.4 mils per kilo. But mind you, these were volunteers, only four volunteers, uh, some good friends of his, I guess, and they had about 25 to 30, and it produced good spread in these cases uh, and some pretty, pretty impressive sensory motor spread of the block in these cases. Now, I'd like you to see this picture carefully because you see this medial aspect of the breast. The medial mammary nerves may not be blocked by a serratus plane block because the, the nerve that forms the medial mammary nerve is actually located deep to the muscle. It's in the intercostal space. So unless the local anesthetic goes deep, it's not going to spread. So very correctly, this part of the breast is not going to be. So if your incision is going to go here, then the patient will say, ouch, when, you put the, when, the, when the incision goes through here. That is provided you get a very good block. So, this is our observation. But it can be, although there's limited data, there are some data showing that it can be also used for uh, chest drain insertion. Yes, I think so. But would you really want to do a block when somebody is an extremist who want to put it for a chest drain for pneumothorax or for perfusion? A few milliliters of local anesthetic in the intercostal space has been used for years since I did my internship and it still works. So I would not recommend you do this for, uh, for your chest drain insertion. But it's a good, it may not be a good indication in this. <clears throat> but finally, my last words to you is that when you have bilateral breast surgery, 
it's a very uh, unfortunate event in some very unlucky individuals. To have cancer on one breast is very unlucky, but to have cancer in both breasts is really lucky plus, you know, unlucky plus. So in this case, doing bilateral paravertebral is something I would not recommend to you, although it may be good. Because if you have a bilateral pneumothorax, you will create a big situation in your, and the patient may succumb, may have mortality. But bilateral serratus plane block may be a very good option in these cases. And whenever I have a bilateral serratus plane uh, breast cancer surgery, I do serratus plane block. Although I don't really know if it works as well as a paravertebral, but this is being prudent. So you have to be prudent in what you do in your clinical practice. So finally, I have a few concluding remarks for you. The concluding remarks are that paravertebral is still the gold standard. Although there are some novel techniques being described, uh, there is more research to be done. Multi-level paravertebral is also not adequate on its own because the breast is innervated by the pectoral plexus of nerves and you need to block these nerves if you want to provide good surgical anesthetic care. If you do not do a pectoral nerve block or pe plexus block, you must be prepared to give them some ketamine during the, uh, or as a preemptively, you can give them 20 to 30 milligrams of ketamine in small aliquots, 10 milligrams, and that will usually tide over that crisis until the breast is removed. Uh, these novel uh, techniques have a real paucity of data. Uh, also, sympathetic blockade is an important component in afferent nociception. So when you look at paravertebral block, it is a proven technique to produce sympathetic blockade, and that's why probably it reduces chronic pain, etc. I doubt if these novel techniques will have the same efficacy in producing sympathetic blockade. Although I may be very critical, I urge you to learn these new techniques because they are technically very simple, but do not expect this efficacy to be as good in, in many situations. Although I'm a paravertebralist, I'm an open to suggestion, but there is need for more objective research before I can believe in what I read. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Tamaka. I apologize, I was a few minutes over time.